In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at how we make a government more powerful, but not too powerful. When the founders had their meeting in Philadelphia in 1787, everyone agreed that the government needed to be bigger than it was under the Articles of Confederation, and that bigger government needed to be able to do more things. But they also were very careful to make sure that this new, bigger, more powerful government wasn't too big and too powerful. Because as we look at the quotes here, this is what the founders are thinking, is the idea that if people fear the government, there is tyranny. We don't want that. We don't want people to fear the government. Jefferson believed that the people ought to be in charge. So we need a bigger government, but it still needs to be one where the people are in charge because that's a, how you have liberty. So how do we do this? Make a bigger government that's going to have more people but what we know we don't want is this bigger government. We're not going to have a king. There's not going to be a king or one main person who is in control, who gets to make all of the decisions and has all of the power. Instead, what they decided to do at this meeting in Philadelphia was the bigger government was actually going to be divided into three branches. And here we see them. So our government is actually made up of three different parts but we call it three branches. And each branch has certain powers or certain things that they are allowed to do. But the thing is, not one of these branches can do everything. They all have specific jobs. So let's look at some examples of the jobs that each branch gets to do. Here we're looking at Congress. Congress is our legislative branch. Only Congress is allowed to make laws. Nobody else in the U.S. government can. Only Congress is allowed to declare war. Only Congress is allowed to create taxes. They are the only branch that has those powers. But they're not the only part of our government. We have a second branch called the executive branch. And the executive branch is headed by the president. The president has certain jobs that are only for the president. For example, only the president can nominate people to be on the Supreme Court. Nobody else has that job. And speaking of the Supreme Court, they make up our third branch, the judicial branch. Only the Supreme Court has the right to look at laws and decide if they are constitutional or not. So again, each branch has their own jobs, and we see them identified here. And the Constitution prohibits them from doing the jobs of other branches. That's why the Constitution is up here above everything, because the Constitution is really what's in charge of all three branches of government. If one branch, if the legislature, tried to do something that was the president's job, that would be unconstitutional, unconstitutional meaning it doesn't follow the Constitution, and so it's basically illegal. So that way, even though we have this bigger, more powerful government, no one person or group really has all of the power. Like I said, we've separated the power among the branches, and here you see some samples of what exactly those powers really are. But nobody gets to do everything. And while they all have different powers that we see here, no one branch is more powerful it's not like the legislature has more power than the executive or the judicial branch is in control of the legislative branch. Each branch is expected to work together so that the government runs smoothly. And that takes us to the second step. So the first protection against a really powerful government is we, the separation of powers. Nobody has the power to do everything. But now let's take a look at the second step. And that is the system of checks and balances. So we stop the bigger, more powerful government from becoming tyrannical by using checks and balances. What this system does is we see each of our three branches of government here, the three parts that make up the United States government, and each branch is required to check up on the other two branches so that they all are roughly balanced in the amount of power they have. Nobody is in charge. They have to work together. So because they check up on each other to stay balanced in power, that's why we call this the system of checks and balances. 
For example, Congress makes laws. When Congress is in the process of putting together a law, we call it a bill. So that's what we're looking at here, how a bill becomes a law. What if they make a law about a draft, meaning they're going to force Americans to join the military? Congress is allowed to make really whatever law they want to. But after Congress makes the law, the way that they get checked up on is the president checks up on their law. The president is going to then look at the law that was passed by Congress and review it. If the president decides that the president likes the bill, then the president can sign it. And when the president signs a law or a bill passed by Congress, he's signing it into law, making it official. But what if the president doesn't like that bill? If the president doesn't like it, then the president also has the option of vetoing it. So the president isn't required to sign bills that Congress passes. If he decides that he's going to veto the law, then it's not a law. The president doesn't approve, that bill doesn't become a law. That's how the president checks up on Congress and keeps them from gaining too much power. Congress knows that any laws that they make will be reviewed. And that's, and that's why we don't have only the president review laws. Courts can also review laws that were passed by Congress and signed by the president. If someone is arrested and they believe that the law was unconstitutional, you can go to court and the courts can review that law. And the courts look it over and they decide if that law created by Congress was constitutional or not. If the courts say that the law violates the Constitution, we as Americans don't have to follow it. And remember, this is the system that's known as checks and balances. But there's one final step that was put into the Constitution that was supposed to stop the U.S. government from becoming too powerful. The final way the founders stopped the bigger, more powerful national government from becoming too powerful was by using a system known as federalism. Federalism means that the national government has to share power with the state governments. And that's what we see happening here. The United States government is represented as the same size as the state of Pennsylvania, showing that not one of them has dominant power and can do whatever it wants to. The two are supposed to share power. That's what federalism is about, the national government sharing power with the state governments. In short, there are some things that only the national government can do. For example, declaring war. This is something only the national government is allowed to do. States can't do that. And powers that belong only to the national government are called delegated powers. However, there are also some things that only the state governments can do, like conduct elections. Each state decides who can vote in their state. States are in charge there. So when it's something that only the states are allowed to do, these are called reserved powers. But what about taxing people? Here, both the federal government, the national government, and your state government can tax you. This is an example of a concurrent or a shared power. The founders wanted a federal government that was going to still be more powerful, but they don't want it to be all powerful, nor do they want to completely strip the states of their power. The founders hoped that by using the separation of checks, of, I'm sorry, the separation of powers, the system of checks and balances, and federalism, that this new bigger, more powerful United States government would be kept in check and would not turn into a tyrannical government.